first match of the day about to get underway. Yarla taking on Fino in this one, and we have the protects and the bans in for uh, this particular matchup. I'm looking forward to this one because it is a very, very different lineup on both sides. It is, yeah, and we're seeing uh, the Priest come back into play for Yala. I think that was a question mark. A couple of players have chosen to keep Faith in the Divine Spirit in a Fire Priest. Yala, one of them. Faith not only to bring it, but then Faith also to protect it in the series. Why do you think that is, Admiral? Are you saying this, these picks and bans in the break, you mentioned that they kind of panned out as you expected? Uh, yeah, so if you look at Fino's side of, of the board, I think that uh, two of his decks are, are pretty weak to Priest. Uh, and specifically, I'm looking at Holy Wrath Paladin, and I'm looking at uh, the Quest Druid being weak to him. You know, Quest Druid does not have a way to really handle what Divine Spear Inner Fire Priest is going to throw at it. If you look at the Paladin deck on Fino's side, there's only one copy of Equality, and so that is one of those cards that ends up being paramount against the way Priest operates. You need Equalities, you need Shrink Rays. You have to be able to adjust the health of minions, and so him having mitigated ways to do that, I think could prove very difficult of a matchup for him. Yeah, I think one of the reasons that people did keep faith with this Priest is because they were expecting so much Quest Druid to come into it, and you know, even extra arms at three, it's still quick enough against Druid to yeah. make that huge minion that they can't interact with. Um, the way Extra Arms worked at two is that on curve, if you played it on two and then played it again on three, you got the health total that was above the level of removal that any deck could throw back against you if they didn't have hard removal. That's still true against Druid in the majority of cases. You can still snowball super hard in the Druid matchup. Yeah. And that looks like a pretty snowbally hand from where I'm standing. Oh, it does. And you know, I, I'm kind of go. I'm kind of going off of a, an age-old adage with this one, where. Uh, you know, I can recall back to the earliest days of Hearthstone I played. One of the biggest problems I had as a Druid player was actually just handling, like, injured Blade Master Circle of Healing. Yep. Like, just that play from Priest was always like, I'm going to take 16 damage from that minimum. Yeah. It was always like, back in the day, I'd, you know, I, I enjoyed playing a lot of mid-rangey and control Priest decks um, when I was coming up as a player. And I was like, oh, I, you know, I do struggle against Druids sometimes. I'm going to, like, look up some of the best Priest players and ask for advice and see what happens. So, you know, I started to talk to Zet a lot, a few other players. Like, oh, how do you win this matchup consistently? And then I figured out that they just literally drew Injured Blade Master Circle every single game. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. To one-two punch? Yeah, I sign mean, me up. It's, it's not much different than drawing one drop, two drop in nope. a lot of decks. I'm curious how Fina's going to play this opening hand. So we see players coin Ooh. all the time for progress on, on turn one of the quest. Is Fino interested in using Innervate to do that same thing? Play your cards. Will be. Yep. Fino learning the lesson from the pre-show. <laughs> ah, yes. That's right. He's like, hey, that's a good idea. Yeah. I, I, honestly, like, Fino is probably one of the biggest advocates of play your cards that I know. Like, as a serious point, um, I remember back in the day there was a lot of debate over the Token Druid matchup. I think you were there commentating at one of the America, American Dream Hacks mm. where the like it was Amnesiac versus someone and they played a Token Druid. It was Amnesiac versus Zelay, there you go. It was the Grand Finals. And it, yeah, exactly. And it was a Token Druid mirror that they played out where they both essentially agreed to fatigue each other. Right? Like yeah. That's how the Token Druid ma matchup worked, is that if one player initiates, then the other one pops off in response. But if both players just kind of agree we're not going to play anything, then the matchup goes to fatigue. And because they played it out in that manner, it created this huge debate about what the correct the way to play the matchup game. was. And Fino actually tweeted, and I'm pretty sure this is verbatim, I play my cards, by the way, in response to that debate. Yeah, I, I think that there definitely uh, was some debate about that as Fino, you know, clearly about to be under pressure with his hero power from Yarla. Um, that style of play was indicative largely of the idea of how much counterplay can affect the matchup. Um, you know, that very similar notion is something that Fino constantly tries to go after. And honestly, it's funny that you mentioned Amnesiac because I was just talking with Frodan about this yesterday. I feel like that that very much is reminiscent of Amnesiac's style of player cards. You know, Amnesiac is a player who squeezes maximum edges out of just every single card he can find. Right. And I think that when both players have average draws or below average draws, that's where Amnesiac's finding his edge. And I think that Fino's very much in that same vein. When both players do not have super ideal draws, he's winning a ton of those games. When a player has an ideal draw, I feel like Fino is, is not quite getting there. And rightfully so, their opponent has an ideal draw. Why would you try to get an edge in that scenario? Yeah. Well, quest complete for Fino, but I will say one thing he hasn't been doing this season is winning a ton of games. He is 0-3, as you see. I don't want to pile on him, but again, we mentioned it last time, the absolute nightmare 
of Fino being our qualified BlizzCon player from Europe for season one and then potentially facing down relegation on season two. Like I, I said that would enter meme infamy forever at that point. It absolutely would. And I also said that if Fino suddenly falls down to 0-4 at the end of week two, he is going to have every single match after that be a much win, a must win match. It's Austin's. certainly going to feel that way. Yeah. You know, and I think about the players who um, I've watched over the years and there's just a stark oh, contrast in the players who it feels like winning means so much to them. And Fino's one of those players. I remember when Fino got his first win at the tour stop in Orange County last year, and it was just an emotional moment. It was him versus Casey in the finals of that tournament. And for both of them, it was like, one of them is going to, it has to win this now. And they both have been working super hard at this. And this is what they're chasing. They're chasing just the wins. And for Fino to have such a wonderful season one, followed by stuff like this happening in season two, like this is no fault of his own. This is no fault of Yarlow. Sometimes the cards just pan out this way. Like he got nut drawn this game. So there was a major decision point, as, as you say, as powerful as Yala's uh, draw has been, there was a major decision point there on that last turn as to where he was going to allocate all the health buffs. He's just seen Fino complete his quest on curve using the Innovate, which is usually quite hard to do when you're going first as Druid, but Fino did have the Innovate to get it done. So Yala is sat there with fear of Oasis Surger coming down. So he had a couple of options. He could have split the buffs so that he had two minions in play that each had more than five health. They're kind of protecting both of them, forcing a double trade into one of them if there was an Oasis Surger. The way he chose to do it instead was to pile everything onto the Injured Blade Master so that it had 11 health, meaning that it actually could not be removed at all if Oasis Surger was in turn. Yeah, and so Fino's not out of this game yet, but it's about as slim as a margin as you can get to, uh, I think, with this situation. He's going to be dropping down to bare bones maximum six life with a board remaining on Yarla's side. And I like the decision from Yarla last turn, as my uh, my good friend Grim Patron likes to say, pile on. <laughs> much more grisly tone to it, of course, but you get the idea. Yeah, that was that was much less kind of threatening, rambunctious than it comes from a from a Grim Patron. I feel like the microphone's too sensitive for me to get that. Ah, good point. I really must consider raspy from the you know, the deep heart of the jungle chest. So again here, Yala does have to fear that removal from an Oasis Surger. He can't get the Blade Master oh, back up above 10, but he can push damage with extra arms. It's he can get it to six, though. Get it to six, six yeah. Is like 10. <laughs> well, okay, yeah, yeah. I, I should have said he can't get it to 11, which is well, what I before, But he can if he rips the two outer of the two Nefeset Ritualists off the Norsha Cleric. I think that possibility did influence the play. And because he also could have buffed with more arms and got like a Pyromancer into play after the fact, kind of max out on power on board, represent the maximum damage coming through. But I think Norsha Cleric Heal achieved a similar thing, but it also had the upside, the absolute nut draw of that Nefeset Ritualist coming off the top. If that's a possibility, if you can achieve two similar things with two similar plays, and one of them gives you a two outer to just kind of end the game, yeah, sure, you take it. And... Does that end the game? 13, 14, 15, 6. I'm counting 16 damage available. Ah, 17, 18 with more arms. So you silence the 18, taunt. Right? You silence yep. the taunt. You cast more arms on whatever. So injured blade master, let's say it's that one. No, it can't be that one because you need the more arms attack. So you power word shield. You silence the 6-6. Six, six, you more arms a non-injured blade master unit. And then you interfire no, the injured blade it master. It doesn't matter what you more arms. You just, what you, this is 15 plus 2 plus 1 plus silence is 18. More, you put more arms anyway. It was yeah. just, it was just lethal. You confused yourself. Yeah, I did. <laughs> it was just lethal. <laughs> it, it was the Monsanto play from yesterday. If you caught America's, he just found a very complicated way to deliver a lethal. Okay. <laughs> that was uh, that had a very simple iteration. But you know, this is uh, you know, this is part of the game. Is you know, if you're gonna play Quest Druid, you're gonna have to handle aggressive starts. And Yarla got the you know one of the best of the best as far as aggressive starts were concerned. But that's part of the edge of the Grandmasters that you're gonna have to find. You have to build decks that punish people for their outside the game decisions. And that's very much a tale of what that game number one is. It's Priest versus Druid. The Priest is going to win the vast majority of those games. Yeah, and again, I think it's a good reason why even with the nerf perhaps impacting its long-term viability on ladder, because I think 
Inner Fire Priest was set up to be an absolute terror of the metagame if it wasn't dealt with. Yeah. Um, because, kind of as a trickle-down effect, because Quest Druid has come into play because of the nerf to Luna's Pocket Galaxy, allowing decks like that more room to operate in the late game, suddenly Priest has had this potential to just survive the nerf anyway and just keep going because one of the most common decks in the game is a good matchup for the Priest. Yeah, and I think that makes a lot of sense. I also think Quest Shaman is pretty darn good for it uh, a lot of the times as well. You know, Priest, I think, is just set up in one of those spots where it's looking like it's going to be strong, but not oppressive. And I think it's a good spot for it. Just nice counterplay. So we got to go to a quick break. When we come back, though, we're going to be jumping into game number two of Fino versus Yarlo. And again, Fino desperately needs to pick up this win, or otherwise that relegation is going to be looming over his shoulder for a number of weeks to come. Stay tuned. My name is Elias Belius, and I go under Boston. My username actually comes from my cat. His name is Boston, so I just took that and make it made it a little bit cooler with the triple Z. So um, yeah, shout out to him. <laughs> when I got the confirmation that I was in Grandmaster, I was overwhelmed by emotions. Even though I haven't had the first place big tournament win, they actually appreciate that consistency and uh, what I've been working for the last couple of years. I'm very good at focusing on a specific thing and keeping myself like ready for the situation. Yeah, and my games and stuff like that. My favorite memory is still my first Dream Act. I remember facing Super JJ. I was a total newcomer, so it was very big for me to, to just be there and just realizing that I could actually beat all these, uh, all these players and it was very cool. My personal goals for this year is uh, I want to qualify for the playoff. Of course, I want to go to the Global Finals, that's, I think, everyone's goal, but uh, I want to be one of the best players. I will try my best to get there, for sure. I'm George Webb, known as Board Control in-game. So my name, Board Control, you would always say, this player has board control when, when you're casting something, and if there's a stone chest boar on board, suddenly that player has board control. The memory that stands out to me from Hearthstone has to be my uh, first tournament victory, which was at Seat Story House Cup 10. I had to face off against Orange in the semi-finals, Tansifka in the quarters, Fino in the round of 16, so it's a pretty stacked event, and then facing Casey in the final, winning that tournament, that really stands out as, as the main memory. I like to play decks that get on board, and you have swing turns, and you have uh, trades, lots of trades on the board, you try and get an edge in that sense. I'm also open to playing lots of other decks like combo decks too, but in general in Hearthstone, spending your mana and playing a guy has been the best play you can do. In Grandmasters, I want to do well. It's a new format, best of three, so it's going to be more difficult to get an edge, but I'll try my best to find that edge and do as well as I can in the tournament. Welcome back to Hearthstone Grandmasters. It's uh, week two and day number two. I'm Nathan, that's Admiral Zamora. I'm joined by Simon Saddle-Welch and Yarla off to a quick 1-0 lead versus Fino. 
as he took a win with Priest over uh, Fino's Druid. And then now, uh, Fino's running back to Druid, and Yarla's going to be on Control Warrior, which is a deck that he very much has been known for uh, in his years competing. Yeah, not just Control Warrior, but Control decks in general. It's where I first heard of Yarla. Um, we saw him in Represent Czech Republic in Hearthstone Global Games for both years, I believe. But sort of just before that, before he started getting prominence in the Czech scene, I started to see like his ladder performances, you know, asked around, like, who knows this guy? Who is he? And just heard from so many people, like, oh, he is the control guy. Like, if you want to learn how to play control decks, just go talk to Yala. He will hook you up. It's been pretty wonderful watching him because I think he really understands, like, taking risks and that management of it. Like, assessing your position where you're at, seeing the game, you know, turns and turns down the road and going, okay, this this particular brawl risk is what I need to take. This particular risk, if, you know, if it's mass hysteria, you know, insert card X that clears the board, kind of. Um, Yarla has just shown absolute mastery with that style of play. He just has such wonderful foresight on how a matchup is going. Now, Admirable, this nine mana card in the middle of Yala's hand, when this had the number seven in the top left corner instead, it was a snap keep in a lot of matchups. How you feel about it now? I'd keep it. Okay. I think in this matchup, Yarla is absolutely the, the defender. And I think that if you're gonna you know, push past the power points at the end of the game, you have to have something that's relevant to do. And when I say relevant to do, that's a continuous effect. Like, Druid is going to continue to develop against you over and over and over Ooh. again. You're always going to be in favor of Mulligan again. So now I'm interested. Um, and so a couple of things that I take into account when I'm thinking about this for Yarla is, number one, uh, that there is some potential for mild aggression in there. He does have Frightened Flunky. Um, he does have only one copy of Omega Devastator, so that cuts into your ability to want to curve out a bit more. Uh, but he does have Super Collider and Plague of Wrath in the deck as well. Mm -hmm. You know, something else to look at are Mega Dillo to two Wardens. So the question is, what's going to provide you scary. more substantial defense? Is it early chipping away and trying to force Fino to, you know, do something to fend himself off or to fend off this push against himself? Right. And is it going to be heavy endgame curve or is it going to be Dr. Boom Mad Genius and having a train of value cards that can really fight for board? Right. And so Yarla has taken that stance. He says the early game and some sort of synergy that makes sense. And, you know, in this case, I think it's pretty specifically looking at our Megadillo and Tomb Warden. See, I was very interested in our interview with Ball Control yesterday where he, <coughs> excuse me, where he validated something that I sort of saw in the matchup as well, which, you know, you say, yeah, okay, you probably want to have an aggressive push at the start because you're likely to get out outvalued in the late game by all the insanity that Questory can do. But I think Ball's words were, yeah, you know, it looks nice, but it's not going to work or something similar to that. And yeah. I, like, yeah, I think that does seem to be the case. Like any aggressive push you, you make, like it's going to get shut down by one Starfall. One hidden Oasis is just going to undo all the work that you've done in the early game. Like for me, I don't think that aggressive plan is ever going to work out for the Warrior. Um, so I do wonder about that that Dr. Boom and if Yala might suffer not having access to that in a timely manner. But then you can just run the statistics, right? And say it costs nine. How often do I just draw it again before turn? nine anyway, and it's pretty dang often. I'm going to take an attempt to parse some boar speak here, um, which if he's going to tweet at me later about this, I understand. Uh, when he says it's not going to work, kind of what I get at there is that the early game cards are not going to be better later. Where they're going to do anything is going to be the early parts oh, of the game. Oh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, a, absolutely agree with it you. makes your deck more dense if you can actually play the early cards early on. And, and you are doing something. Like, this damage isn't irrelevant. It does, at some point, present a threat. Fino will have to do something. But it's also yep. board development, which helps you answer as the game progresses. Yep. Instead of just having, you know, step one, do thing, step two, do thing, and your first two steps in the instance of keeping Dr. Boom be blow up things, you've already proactively destroyed things. And now, with Zilliax attaching, you actually have an aggressive push going. This might work. For sure. This is about as good as it gets. Um, I do definitely agree with your additional analysis. Um, but I think I think Paul said what he meant. I, I think that's part of what he meant. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. Uh, Fino, on the other hand, <laughs> is going to have to do something pretty noteworthy to stop a 7 7 Divine Shield crashing through him. And this is where those one off cards that I mentioned aren't going to necessarily do the work he needs them to. Like, that is a pretty miserable response to wow. a 7 7 Divine Shield being in play. Well, I mean, Yarlis just got the dream this game. Yeah. And uh, hey, I mean, if, if it's going to increase your chances of drawing this curve, and this is what Yala believes is the way to uh, to win in the matchup by hitting this absolute nut curve and curving out, then who am I to, to question the control god? I mean, I do think that the two board in our Megadillo is uh, doing a number on Priest. I'm sorry, on uh, Druid here. It's that 
that happened and the boom came back immediately after the second Tomb Warden. Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, his deck was just in the perfect order. Oh, okay. Of course you go face. It's yeah, seven. I mean, he gave it the due diligence. He had to think, but yeah, seven's a big number. You make the medium noise. Are we entering the territory where we actually start to feel bad for Fino yet? Because this is well, this is not a good look. And through no fault of his own, he is just taking a beating this series and has done in a couple of the previous series as well. I mean, really, the only thing that you could you could call into question at this point, I think, is deck choice. But that is at best debatable. Um. Or at worst, debatable, I guess. Slana looks good to me this week. Yeah. Ah, the difference between seven and nine. Yeah. It's the of Dr. Boom, it's shield block. Right, it's the first potentially even somewhat weak turn that Yala has, and that somewhat weak turn involves a what well, that's buffed, so it's a five ten hecklebot. Yeah, I I think this is a pretty weak turn. You know, you're not really taking anything off board. No. Nope. Fino has stopped the pressure. And so this is what Bor meant by it's gonna fail. Yes. Like you'll get some work done. You're gonna cause Fino some trouble. You're gonna disrupt some of his turns. Th this particular push isn't going to be what kills him. Right. And what he then added to that is that it's important that you then back this up by having the removals and the brawls and the warpath and the Dr. Boom afterwards. And Yala has part of that equation, but he is still missing mass removals. Yeah. But he does just have big Tomb Wardens, which honestly might just be better. Might, might well be. Minions are good. Play your cards. Apart from that Zephyrus on the far left, Fino did clearly learn a lesson from uh, Tyler's rather embarrassing blunder earlier today in APAC. Turn five, play Zephyrus, immediately cover face with hands. Yes. Um, I believe Tyler just forgot about the fact he wasn't playing a Highlander deck and just played his Zephyrus. Grandmaster, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Take off that complexity jersey, kid. You're embarrassing the brand. Well, no, keep it on. I want Saddle to remember. Whoa, 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 whoa. I want Saddle to remember. Even complexity can make mistakes. Yeah, I mean, I, we we just Tyler is a fantastic player, and like that happens yeah. to the best of players. Your, your brain just switches off momentarily when you do something that was monumentally stupid. Yeah, you've talked about it at length, and honestly, I want you to keep discussing that point as much as you can. That the best players are the ones who understand macro game plans, not min max little things. The best of the best are the ones who do both. Who do both exactly? Yeah. Just hot race. <laughs> However, if you're just doing the mid-maxing on, like, mechanical things, you're pretty terrible. Like, <laughs> that just doesn't do anything. It's kind of true. Yeah, no, it really is. Yeah. <laughs> From a competitive standpoint, not as not as a person. Come on. <laughs> Who are you clarifying? Oh, I can feel it in chat. I can, just, I can feel that it's there. No one is on the other side of this argument. That's not true. There is probably, like, 10,000 people. <laughs> Second Loti. Second Loti. And that is a big deal when you do have to fight for removal because weirdly Loti is one of your best uh, removal tools. Just being that, that you know persistent spell damage totem that can't be removed turns Swipe and Starfall into these insane forces of nature. Yeah. And so Un kind of intended, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. It wasn't, but I'm claiming it anyway. We're getting to the point where we can see why Dr. Boom is so important, but also why the Tomb Wardens and the Armega Dealer were important. You needed to have a proactive setup into Dr. Boom. Like, the fact now? that it costs nine now, you don't get to do things alongside it. Like, this is a card you have to set up now in certain matchups. Yeah. Like, Jess Sayan talked about this in an interview yesterday in America's region, where he was like, he thinks that moving to nine mana is a drastic change. And I, how could it not be? It's... You just tag two extra mana yeah. on it. Like, oh, I, I agree. In in practice, it's an enormous change, and it will be a significant impact on on matchup win rates. I just like philosophically, I still, from a personal bias point of view, would rather have had something changed about the way Doctor Boom functions because I'm not a huge fan of the way the Doctor Boom games play. Fair enough. Yeah. Why is Fino dropping the thanks here? Is it because he's got the extra loady with swipe? This turn ends up not being that good. I'm kind of curious about this. Why did he drop a thanks? Mm -hmm. 
pretty fine question. Critical turn for Fina. This is probably the most critical turn of the game now. So he can get a, what, six plus three swipe here if he wants it, which is not looking super effective mm. against the board state. No, it's not. So my, my question is, A, how do you get the board under control? B, how do you do that without sacrificing too many resources? C, how do you leverage that position into a push? And so that's a lot of questions for Fino if he's anywhere even close to that neighborhood, which I promise you he's probably got about three or four more questions on his mind. Oh, yeah. What to do? Talking about Fino's deck uh, and the way it's built, he's playing the variation with Chef Nomi and with King Ferris in it. Power. And so he doesn't have the massive endgame potential of doubling up hands with at least with at least the enlightened. Right. And I think that that changes a lot of the way that these turns will look. Where he needs to have pressure sustained on board and deliver damage. And so to me, that's the sacrifice of A, the big body of the scenarios, which is likely to be brawled in a position like this anyway. And then B, that first war druid Lodi. I think this is a wonderful turn for Fino that now asks Yarla pretty much those same questions aside from the pushback to Fino part. It's how do you continually stay alive afterwards. Yeah. And now you see the effect of that Dr. Boom having not come down last turn. What now? Which I guess in reflection is what that thanks was about. It's just like, oh, I, you didn't play Dr. Boom. My thanks to you. <laughs> Genuine thanks. Yeah. It's probably just what it was, right? Yeah. I mean, because I, I think Dr. Boom's going to have a tough time coming down if, if Fino uh, can draw any gas here next turn. It did seem like the turn last turn, right? Like you talked about how the the Armagadillo and the, the Tomb Wardens just put up that wall that allowed him to have that Dr. Boom turn if he wanted it. Set it up. Yala turned it down, went for the Snip Snap value instead. Yep, it's it's gonna be the probably one of the few times that I, I'm gonna say it, I think that was an error from Yarla. Like he had a clear game plan in mind, but I think the, the judgment was an error. What now? You're so used to being able to play that card and make an impact. So he will, I think, likely have to set up for it next turn. Vito's no, hand a, a little bit dry here. Yeah, and with that Starfall draw, that is almost certainly going to be clear skies for Dr. Boom Mad Genius on the following turn. Well, Yala. we are looking at two Crystal Merchants, though. Could you make it three Crystal Merchants with the Floop? Behold, sure. Jewels of the I think sound. not having Behold, Elise in your deck certainly changes your mindset sound. on how you play uh, the Floop because, you know, there's you have at least in your deck you can then duplicate a fluke which allows you to create you know crazy nigh on infinite loops of minions coming out but in terms of a couple of card draws fino picking up the uh, the feoris and the nomi here eight cards remaining and yala is just going to have to play the boom and let those crystal merchants draw again next turn which is going to accelerate the game very quickly now yeah. towards the point where fino has an active zephyrus in his hand an active nomi in his hand so and that king p one Brawl's been used. That leaves Yarlow with a second copy of Brawl and the Plague of Wrath somewhere in the deck. Um, has really yet to draw cards, though. And so I think for Fino, this is going to be a game plan of turboing out the rest of uh, your deck yep. and then saying, you got to have it. Like it, This is going to be a threat test on Yarlow's side. Agreed. So Weapons Project Harrison Jones on the following turn to try to dig for those answers. Perhaps you draw the perfect card and you don't have to do that. Ooh. Swipe and Nourish now picked up, which means the King Feoris is going to be a huge threat. Zilliax. Zilliax. Zill yeah! I was going to go with the full chant until he took it. And then if he didn't take it, I was going to boo. Unity. <laughs> Precision. <laughs> Perfection. That yeah, this was the turn to draw for Yarla, too. Yep. So, you know, there are multiple ways to get Boom set up, and that's definitely one of them. I think this payoff has yielded a bit higher uh, expectation for Yarla. Does that mean you're walking back on your uh, call of it being a mistake previously? Um, no. Yeah, that's right. I'm putting you on the chopping block. No, I don't think it was. I think the payoff ended up being higher because of the outcome of Fina's particular hand. 
Uh, I think that his previous play was stronger because it accounted for more circumstances on Vino's side. So it wasn't a mistake. Um, I said it was an error in judgment. Mistake, but if you want to get really technical about it, the only mistakes you make are like going back to the Tyler thing. You forgot that your thing didn't do what you thought it did. You thought it did something and it didn't. That's a mistake. Yarla intentionally didn't play Dr. Boom. That's an error. <laughs> Different. We've talked about semantics what before. Oh, at length. <laughs> and, and, will, and will continue to do so. <laughs> exhibit A. More like Exhibit Q at this point, I guess. But Yeah, damn straight. And so for Fino, are you interested in emptying the rest of the deck? That would require mm. a burn of a card. A couple cards, perhaps? He's got eight in hand. Yeah, single burn. He does have... Faoris, fluked Faoris for the next couple of turns if he wants to go that way anyway. Yeah. Um, it, you know, he may want to end up on Nomi, fluked Nomi. Um, if, it, you know, if he wants maximum power, that's on average a lot stronger than the uh, Faoris. Yeah. But the fact that this Faoris and fluked Faoris kind of fill up two turns to get him to the end of his deck where Nomi is active, I think, like, I kind of like this line because I don't want to take time off to draw cards. I just, wa I just want to bomb chain every turn wow. from now until the end of the game so that those four cards exhaust themselves naturally while I'm playing a threat every turn yeah. in Fino's position. So two factors I look at there. Number one, the timing of Feoris. Uh If Plague of Wrath is going to be an issue, what that means is you want it to be against Yarlow's turn where he doesn't have the Microbots <laughs> and he does not have Kaboom. Yes. Uh, both of those things are true right now. Number two, if they're going to brawl, they're going to brawl some of their own board in this position. So cool. you like that idea as well. Number three, you're really hoping they don't have Super Collider. <laughs> and that's exactly what Yarla drew on this point. So now with the Super Collider and then the 4-7 in the middle for Fino, oh, okay, which its death rattle restores some amount of health to Yarla's side, I feel like this Feoris push is, this is to try to close the gap until Chef Nomi's. Exactly. It's to try to force resources until Chef Nomi's. Yes. Super Collider prevents that resource expenditure and I think that's the problem. Oh, I yeah, I think between thing. Super Collider, Shield Slam, Restless Mummy, like whatever combination you want to use this turn, it does pick this board apart pretty effectively. God, not even though, it just says two more than go. It's a good use of your stuff. It's more mana efficient this way. I guess so. Mana efficiency is a weird nebulous process though, because spending five on a Super Collider is incredibly efficient because it then has that mana spent for the next three turns Yeah. in effect. So it, it, it does enter that kind of weird argument of what is more efficient. Weapons are generally one of the most efficient things you can do with your mana across all of Hearthstone. Discovering extra scenarios is also one of the most efficient things you can do in all of Hearthstone. Yeah, I'm thinking that's the pick. I'm not super interested in trading my minions through these, but you know, you gotta do what you gotta do, and you are connecting for 12. So shredding armor important. This is kind of what I worry about with him not using the, the removal cards on the previous turn is, what's well, this shield slam doing now? It's got kaboom. That is true. But I will say, he didn't know he was going to get Kaboom next turn when he made the decision on the turn before. Yeah, you're 50-50 on Kaboom to Microbots. Right. Microbots obviously wouldn't have been super good here. Okay, then. Fino has definitely been making the most of this particular game, though. I really, really liked uh, the timing on the King Ferris. I wasn't, I wasn't really thinking about it that much. Yeah. For whatever reason. I guess because I've just been seeing players constantly hold the card in certain matchups. Like specifically druid mirrors, they just seem apprehensive to let that rip. Yeah, I think it just made sense. This he had he had four cards left in his deck, so he needed to find something to do for three to four turns that kept up pressure on Yala. He didn't want to play Nourish and just empty his deck because that was too slow in the position. He wanted to play a big nine slash ten drop threat every single turn. So he had the one with the Feoris. Oh, he had the thing. Discover to pick up another big threat potentially off that, which he did with the Scenarius. He has the Flute. He has the Zephyrus. Wow. That's that's four potential things that he can do to fill that gap of four cards until his deck's exhausted. He can get over there. That restless money. So now for Fino. This is a tough spot. I wonder if he's reading this as no Plague of Wrath due to the Kaboom Plague of Wrath not happening. Very possible. 
And Yarla, I, I think, think it would be a pretty valid read, honestly. Yeah, Yarla, I think, wisely holding it as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Recognizing that I'm coming up on Nomi turns, I have to be able to handle those. If I don't clear this off, does that prompt Fino to perhaps use the floop on the scenarios that he's got? And then hopefully I can respond again. You know, if he floops here, I think it's unlikely that he's trading over the the Omega Devastator, but is it likely that he star falls it instead? I think Yarla needs that 4-5 to survive this turn with the plan that he set up. Right. I'm almost out of cards. So he's going to Zephyrus here. I think he actually needed that. It's hard to see the Zephyrus on the far left, but I think both of his last remaining cards are Innovate. So that Zephyrus has only just become live with that draw. Are you going to Zephyrus this turn, though? I don't know if it's better to Zephyrus Zephyrus to... to loop the scenarios to go to right, right, right. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. a tough turn. That's that's the problem with the allocation here is like what do you want the floop on? Probably the Chef Nomi. Yeah, agreed. Pino says this is just enough pressure for now. Take eleven. At this point like the game plan changes, like you said, because you have that eleven damage in play, you don't necessarily need to add to it. You can just push eleven wow. and say go. Wow, that that brawl is so important right now. So now Fino is going to play Chef Nomi. Kaboom gets flipped. That activates the Plague of Wrath for Yarla. Yep. Then and there boom. it was. The last two cards were innovates. So that Zephyrus has only just become live on the previous turn. And Fino, I think, is realizing what's happening here. Honestly, there is a good chance that he foregoes a Nomi this turn. Also, here's a note. Those two innovates being bottom hmm. of the deck have actually been very important because he, there were multiple turns where he had Crystal Merchant on the board and he just spent 10. Yeah. I think that Fino needs to genuinely consider foregoing a Chef Nomi here. You know, I'm looking at potentially Zephyrus Tyrion. I'm looking at Hidden Oasis. But I think with hmm. the Kaboom there, even just in the vein of Yarlan not even having Plague of Wrath, the thought that he could draw Plague of Wrath here, I think could potentially drive Fino away from this. For so long, I preached about how he was a player who avoided catastrophes and disasters in games. The Plague of Wrath right now would be exactly that. And he could see he's going deep into the tank trying to figure it out. Ooh, okay. It's a big risk. Only six cards remaining in Yala's deck after he draws this turn. Plague of Wrath needs to be in there for this not to be kind of a disaster for Fino in this position. But I guess Fino's argument here is it's not just he has to have the Plague of Wrath this turn. He has to have the Plague of Wrath this turn and then be able to follow up with Brawl the turn after. I think I think maybe you can forego it on the Kaboom part and get there. I really think it's possible. You know, I'm staring at the hand so it's easier for me to say. Fino's having to do that guesswork and calculate odds. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Because if you, if you just have like a really slow turn, like Hidden Oasis swipe, I guess. Like Zephyrus Tyrion slow? Uh, Zephyrus Tyrion, I guess, is a possibility, yeah. So now the Brawl is going to come in. And Fino is perhaps going to be left with zero threats here. He will certainly be left with zero threats, right? If the 6-6 six, six survives, I imagine that Yarla has interest in double shield slamming. We have, shield he has Zap. Or, yeah. He has Zap, yeah. And so now your final push is the Tyrion. I think Fino was just put in a tough spot, had a tough call to make. I don't think that holding on to the Nomi necessarily wins him, but I think it changes the dynamic of the game. And now staring down a Discovery Mech, you know, if this was your initial your rather than your follow-up. Could it have changed things? Maybe. All Fino has left now is this board plus 15 damage from an Ashbringer plus a 6-6. Six, six. And I just don't see that resolving against Yala's hand. Nope. Vicious Scrap Hound uh, with Beryllium Nullifier hand as well. So yeah. big armor hand available. Plenty of removal this turn just to take care of this. Yep, Yala's like, well, you know what? 
let me just work out whether I can face tank this or not. <laughs> because the game is solvable, right? You can yeah. actually just work this out. What he's doing? This point. Yep, yep. You can see him counting. What does he have left in his hand? He has deck tracker. It's legal for this tournament. So he's like, oh, Starfall, Nourish, Hidden oh, Oasis, okay, Innovate. Then. Fine. Yep, he saw the shake of the head. Suspicions confirmed. So, so, okay, if I shield slam this, you, uh, Fino can carve off my armor next turn with the Ashbringer. Then how do I kill the next thing? The next thing is a 6-6. Six, six. I have plenty of ways to kill a 6-6. Six, six. Okay, fine, I'll shield slam it. That's game. Yarla, 2-0 over Fino and moves up to a 3-1 record. A lot of the positions that were early on in Season 1 of Grandmasters have flip-flopped as we've also uh, had a bit of a, dis a division swap up. The odd and even uh, seeds in the division at the end of the finish had swapped over in division play. And so now Yarla, uh, one of the players that's you know in the front runners of the pack. This was not the case in, in season one, and now he's sitting at a three and one record. And a complete reversal of fortunes on both sides is now Fino, who was of course our champion of last season, who is qualified for BlizzCon, starts off the season zero four and uh, oof. Oh, it's a rough spot to be in. Because it's got to be no, someone. No one wants to be. Yeah, but it has to be someone. But does it have to be the guy that qualified for BlizzCon out of the first season, Admirable? I suppose this is the reality that we're in. <sighs> well, I mean, we will wait and see. It's early doors, of course. We're being reactionary. 0-4 is recoverable. Like, for example, if he won every game from here, he finishes the season 10-4, and four, which is the absolute best record that anyone had last season. So it's still completely possible that he flips this on his head, but that would require a 100% win rate from this point, which it doesn't seem like you're going to be able to do in Grandmasters unless your name is Hunter Ace. Yeah, 10 0 streak at the start of last season. Yeah. And PNC, who had a 7 7 record in Americas, so ended up being the champion of that season as well, just barely skirting into the playoffs by that point. Yeah. But uh, we have a winner's interview ready, so Yarla, can you hear us? <laughs> did I hear Yarla there? Yes. Well, I did. We hear you. Yala, do you hear us? You okay? You there? Can you hear me, guys? Yeah, you go. Hello? There Perfect. we go. Congratulations. Big win. You move up to a three and one record on this one now, and uh, you took down Fino in this one and last season champion. That's got to feel pretty good. Yeah, of course it does. Um, I, I haven't played against Fino for a long time, so, and I think my record from last year against him was like one, three or something, so good to take W against him. Uh, so you've obviously started off this season as a whole quite a lot better than you did last season. Um, do you think that's just variance, or do you do you feel better in the new format? Do you feel better in the new meta game? Like, what do you what do you put your performance down to? Uh, yeah, I I think I'm not that confident in, in the meta game yet, but uh, I definitely like the multiple class format compared to uh, specialist. Like my win rate in specialist this year was terrible, like something around thirty five percent when I had. Uh, like 60% win rate over last year. So wow. yeah, I definitely prefer the, the multiple class. Uh, what What's hindering your confidence uh, in this metagame right now? Uh, well, I'm just uh, unsure about some matchups and stuff. Uh, also, I don't play that much as last year when we played like uh, for le leather, like every day for HCT points. So yeah, I just need to play more, I think. So I want to ask your opinion on um, Dr. Boom specifically. Like, we know you as a very big control player and control warrior player. Like, how do you feel about the change from seven to nine? Like, what kind of impact does it have? Have you liked the nerf? Like, what's your experience with the card now? Yeah, I think the nerf... I th I thought in the beginning, I thought the nerf will be, like, fine. But I think it it uh, it's uh, weaker than I expected. Uh, I think the nerf, like did the, a lot to wire, but it's still all right card. If you get to boom, I think uh, you are in pretty good spot, but it's basically just harder. You can go coin boom on six. You have to wait until like eight or nine. So it feels slow. Also in the mulligan, I wasn't sure if I should keep him, but it, it was nine mana card. So it didn't seem that appealing to keep it. I kind of I kind of like tossing away that one. I want to zone in on that uh, particular mulligan because uh, you know we don't really talk about him too much. I, I guess um, it looked like th to me that you were hunting almost specifically for like our Megadillo and Tomb Warden uh, to kind of get that game rolling. What what were you specifically searching for uh, with the mulligan? Uh, against Druid. Yes. Yeah. Uh, basically, I think I was searching for like the early tempo. Try to kill him. Uh, I think it went pretty well, but uh, he ended up stabilizing, so I had to find like plan B. Uh, in the spot where I had to use first brawl, 
uh, I wasn't I didn't like that but I think I was supposed to and then I, I just needed to find Brawl and uh, uh, Plague to clear double Nomi and uh, then I never lose so yeah, using first Brawl didn't felt uh, good but I think I had to do it and then I found the right pieces and I won the game Anything else? That's all from me. So I say well played, congratulations, and uh, we will speak to you again soon, I'm sure. Thank you. See you next guy. Uh, see you next weekend, guys. Bye bye. Looking forward to it. Yeah, you damn right. You'll see us again next weekend because you're gonna win again. That's yeah. the confidence we need. You bet your britches. You, by the way, I'm calling you out on this. You are such a fair weather fan. You're like, yeah, 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 I like that mulligan. I asked you a direct question about whether you'd keep that boom, and you said you'd keep it. Oh, just because I would it keep it doesn't mean I dislike the opposite. <laughs> the opposite. Like, for instance... <laughs> you are infuriating! Oh, no, 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 no. This is a perfect analogy for this. For instance, what's okay. your favorite food? Mm, just, oh, just pick something. Ramen. Okay, so ramen. Do you eat ramen every single meal? No. Sometimes you go for... Literally any other food in the world. Sure. Yeah. Because it's not because you dislike ramen. It's not because you dislike the other things that you eat ramen instead. You like them both. <laughs> It's a horrible. It's a How horrible. is that a horrible analogy? Because in this in this context, we're not using like as like a preference for thing. We're using like as a do you think this is correct or incorrect? It's a different meaning of the word. You already know my opinion on that. I don't think they're just correct and incorrect in Hearthstone. I think it's a grading scale. Should we move on to the next match?